Lesson 17. Managing uh, secure settings. Uh, CompTIA A plus core to exam. In this lesson, we will cover uh, three objectives. One, configure workstation security. Two, configure browser security. And three, troubleshoot workstation security. Topic one, 17A uh, of this lesson is then uh, configure workstation security. Password best practices. Complexity requirements are necessary to mitigate risks from brute force and dictionary attacks. Uh, but do note that the status of some of these attributes as best practice is no longer firmly established. Um, for example, length is preferable to the use of highly cryptic mixing of uh, character types. Uh, requiring a mix of character types forces users into selecting easily masked substitutions uh, zero for out, for instance, or makes passwords impossible to remember and causes users to write them down. The latest NIST guidance also deprecates password expiration, except when a breach is discovered. Um, when it comes to uh, BIOS in the UEFI, passwords are also covered. We talked about this in Core 1. Uh, remember that there are uh, supervisor access to the system setups and end user or boot the system, right? Uh, password types. Um, also remember that these are pre-boot authentication systems. This authenticate uh, individual users rather than just making the user supplied a device password. Uh, they're not very common in reality, but uh, if you have a system in a public place uh, where people have access to it, it would probably be good to do this because there are free tools out there that someone can put in a USB, uh, boot a Windows computer, and then have access to the Windows and, and break the password. Um, but anyway, so uh, again, length is one of the most important thing. Uh, yes, you want to have different character types, uh, maybe uppercase and, and lowercase, because many systems and web pages would not even allow you to create a password if they don't have those uh, complexity requirements that, that are in place. Uh, but anyway, so again, uh, even though NIST doesn't recommend this anymore, but in reality, a lot of companies use password requirements expiration, so your password will expire after uh, a number of days. Uh, you have to strike a balance. It's not good to have password, let's say, uh, expired every week. That would be really bad because it's impossible to remember so many passwords. Uh, I think the one important thing is that uh, the use of a password manager to make sure it is important that you have different passwords for different uh, services. Um, I know that remembering those passwords is difficult, but then if you have a, you can have a password manager that is well protected. And yes, you need to protect that password manager because if the password manager is compromised, then you lose everything. So um, you need to strike a balance there. Uh, but it's important to do that. We talked about that uh, bias passwords. Now, this is a screenshot of the local um, a group policy in your in the Windows workstation where you can basically create policies for your password, um, enforce password history, having a minimum password age, uh, that's when the password will expire. In this case, by default, it's 42 days. You may increase that to maybe 90 days or three months or, or whatever the, the, the requirements are. Uh, the minimum password age basically means that once you change the password, you cannot change it right back. Uh, a lot of companies make it so that you have to wait at least one day to do that. The minimum password length, right? Um, so how minimum is the password? By default here is zero. Basically means that you can have a blank password, that it's not good, right? So those are the kind of things that uh, you configure in a password policy. And also, um, together with this is also the account password policy. For example, uh, when you enter, uh, let's say, five, seven, ten bad passwords, the password will be locked up. That will prevent a brute force attack for entering passwords 
password indefinitely, for example. So really good uh, password best practices that you need to understand for your daily life as a as an IT person, but also uh, to pass the um, A plus certification exam. Some end user best practices are uh, log off when, when not in use uh, to mitigate what is called the lunch uh, time attacks. So when you're not using your computer, you step away, you should um, uh, either log off or use a uh, screensaver lock. In most companies, they use this automatically on, 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 a, uh, on, a, on a GPL, where basically after, let's say, you know, five, seven, 10 minutes, your computer will lock, right? Uh, you could manually lock your workstation before leaving on a tenant. If you go to, uh, I don't know, if you go to the bathroom or you're gonna take a, a break, whatever, you gotta make sure that you uh, lock your workstation. Uh, uh, secure and uh, protect critical hardware. So if you have a tablet or a laptop or a phone, make sure that it is protected if you're going to leave it unattended. Some companies you use locks to protect if you are in an airport, for example. Uh, again, uh, use a screen lock for your those devices uh, as well, and especially when you are in a public uh, places. Uh, secure personally um, identifiable um, information, PII and passwords. Um, it's very important that you work in an environment, you work with personal information, you need to take those, uh, those uh, extra steps. Like uh, the concept of a clean desk policy basically means that you do not leave paper laying around with personal information, right? Um, also in your computer, if you're going to store uh, documentations that have uh, PII, that should be encrypted or uh, you should be careful not making unauthorized copies, right? Or somebody just going in, grabbing a piece of paper and making a copy out of that uh, information. So uh, really important uh, end user practices to take into account. When it comes to uh, account management, uh, restrict user uh, permissions. So in most companies, you know, you, you're only giving permissions to the files and folders that you need to do your job, which is part of what is called list privilege, right? Um, when it comes to permission, permissions refer to files and folders, right? Now, when it comes to the operating system, then we talked about rights and privileges. For example, you may not have the right to change the system time or the privilege. Uh, instead of saying like, oh, I don't have permission to change the system time, the right terminology is the uh, rights uh, um, and privileges. Um, restrict privileges with the uh, UAC or the user account control and pseudo. So in Windows, even though you are an admin, an administrator, when you do stuff, you are doing it as a regular user. If the system, if the task that you are performing requires elevated, elevated privileges, a little Windows will pop up letting you know that you need uh, you know, elevated privileges. That's what is called UAC. We will demo that later on. In in Win in Linux, it would be the sudo. You gotta run sudo and then the command to do the command as the root, uh, uh, which is the uh, privilege account in Linux. Another important aspect of account management is changing the default administrator user account and password. Uh, by the way, in Windows 10 and Windows 11, when you install it for the first time, you need to create a, uh, a user account and the administrator account is already disabled. Uh, so the default, so there is an account called administrator in any Windows computer and in Linux it's called the root and usually they are disabled and they should remain disabled. So what you should do, you should create an administrator account with your own uh, uh, name, right? Every individual that uses a computer should have a unique name. Um, it's important that... Um, uh, not using share accounts. So you should avoid using share accounts because if let's say you have a computer with an account called administrator and five people use that same username and password, if something happened, there's no way to, uh, there's no way for accountability. You cannot trace back to who did what. And also if there is a data breach, right, and it's done with the administrator account, it's gonna be very difficult to do a root cause analysis and, 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 and find attribution of who did that. So um, 
Sometimes it's impossible. You you know, there are cases in which, I don't know, maybe the HR department, there are uh, five people and they need to use, uh, you know, a software that they have a license for one account. They need to use that. So it, it happens. But again, you should avoid this at, at all costs. Um, the guest account in Windows is disabled by um, by default. So unless you enable it, you don't have to disable because it is disabled. But again, so these are some of the things that uh, are important to keep in mind uh, for your daily lives as an IT um, uh, person, um, and, and also uh, you know to be able to pass the um, A plus certification exam. Uh, some uh, account policies that you can configure in your workstation. Um, you could restrict the uh, login times. You can um, fail attempts lockout. In other words, if someone type in the password, you know, uh, run five times, your computer could be locked out uh, for a number of times or indefinitely until the administrator unlocks that account. Uh, you can configure how many concurrent logins. Well, in Windows anyway, it's only, you know, two, uh, uh, well, in Windows Server, two people can log in at the same time. Um, in, um, in Windows um, 11, you know, not too many people can log in concurrently. Um, so anyway, so that's already part of it. But you could do that as well, um, in, in the, especially in the domain controller. You can use the timeout or screen lock. We talked about this. Um, if an account is um, disabled or is locked, then you can uh, re-enable that account. Uh, if you think that a password has been compromised or is too weak, then you can reset the password. This is a screenshot of a computer in Windows that is joined to a domain. And here are some of the properties. Uh, speci uh, specifically, we are talking here about the uh, account uh, the account tab, right? Where we have the user and logger name uh, and the pre-Windows name. This is the name that logs in into Windows. Um, normally, these names are the same, but they could be different. Uh, for example, in, in, if you have Office 365, you need the whole email to log in. You cannot log in with this NetBIOS name, but in Windows, you can log in with this name if you have a local password on Windows. <clears throat> now, so as we said before, you can configure uh, a Windows to log on at a specific times. For example, you can say that a user can only log on from Monday to Fridays from 8 to 5 p.m., if that is the case. Um, you can say, well, a user can only log on from this workstation. Th these are, you know, settings where security is really, really high in some environments. But in reality, this is not very commonly used in many companies. Uh, this indicates over here that the account has been locked and then it needs to be unlocked. Otherwise, you won't be able to log into your computer. When an account is created for the first time, you, you go into a company, they create your account. So normally it is configured so that the user must change the password and next log on. So when you try to log on, you're going to get a message saying, hey, you need to change your password. And then you do that. Um, so obviously you don't want to, uh, most, in most cases, you don't want the user uh, not be able to change the password because then again, the user won't be able to do that. But if you have a workstation and it is controlled and you don't want the user to change the password, then, then you do that. So it depends on, on the case. Um, if you want a password to never expire, when well, this is where you configure it. Uh, in most cases, if you have a policy that password must be changed every 90 days, then you don't want to do that because the password then won't expire. Um, this is an old setting for backward compatibility that is rarely used anywhere. This section over here, it's about the account itself, not the password. So let's say that you have uh, temporary uh, workers that will come in and will leave in three months, then you can configure this account so that the account itself expire in three months. It doesn't matter that the password hasn't expired. If the account is expired, then uh, that user won't be able to log into that account. So what is this execution control all about? Um, so first of all, let's start by saying that um, you should always install software from trusted sources, right? Not from untrusted sources. 
Um, when you download code from the internet, uh, most of the time that code, make sure that the code is signed and that they have, uh, you can do hash verification, which basically what it is, the, the, the vendor or the software developer created a hash of that software and um, you download the software, you can run a, um, a tool to get the hash and then you compare those hashes. If it's, if it's the same, it means that it has not been tampered with. If it's different, that means that it has been tampered with and it's not legitimate. Um, for the A+, you don't need to know how to do this, but it is important that you know what this means. Uh, it's important that you download software from the legitimate stores. Right? Uh, there are a lot of third-party illegitimate stores out there that are very dangerous. So if you're going to download software from, uh, from an iPhone, for an iPhone, you make sure that you download from the Apple store. If it's uh, Android, make sure that it's from the uh, Apple Play Store, the Google Store, right? And, and so forth. Windows, the same thing. Uh, Windows have also the Windows, uh, the Windows Store. Or if it's from a website, Again, make sure that it's a reputable website and that you can verify um, the hash, right? Um, now, this piece over here refers to the fact that we can configure Windows with this autoplay. So when you insert a USB or you connect uh, or a DVD or a CD, um, if you still use those, then uh, autoplay will automatically ask you, okay, what did you want to do, right? And then you can choose some, some actions. Uh, this is uh, convenient in, in, in most cases, but also it could pose a, uh, a security risk, right? Um, you can configure again the default uh, action for, for, for the media. Um, the default here is take no action, which basically means you need to select what you want to do manually. Okay, uh, so having it to do automatically may be dangerous because it, let's say that somebody drop a USB drive in a parking lot, uh, like uh, hoping for you to pick it up and put it into your computer, like, you know, a lot of cyber criminals do that, right? If you have that USB and will automatically execute, your computer could be infected. So th th that's one of those things that could happen. Um, in Windows, we talked about this UAC, the user account control. It's good to keep this enabled, not disable that. Uh, I will, I'll show you later on how to um, how that should be configured in the demo. But again, those are things to keep in mind. So Windows come with the Windows Defender antivirus software. It's important to make sure that the virus is up to date. Everything is clean, right? Um, and that um, no, no actions is needed in the setting. That's a good thing over there. The software is up to date. Again, I can run a scan and all kind of stuff. So it's important to be vigilant and to check the antivirus software to, to make sure that it's on a healthy state. Okay. Um, when it comes to antivirus, they, they use either definitions or heuristic scanning. Definitions basically means that there are signatures that need to be updated constantly. Heuristic basically means that they can, they have rules, right? Uh, that when they are scanning the software. Now, this is not for you. This is not something that, that you do. Again, this is the way that the software antivirus works. It is very important that your antivirus software it's up to date right the, the 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 definitions and the scan engine definitions are uh, updated almost on a daily basis microsoft da does that if you have the windows defender now the scan engine is part of the operating system and then so that will be updated when you update the operating system um activating and deactivating right so if your computer get infected one of the first thing that the software tries to do is to deactivate your antivirus software right or the um, you know temporarily disable online scanning now sometimes this may have to be done for a legitimate reason if you're trying to uh, download or use something that that uh, or something is giving trouble but in most cases again um, this needs to be le left intact. Um, can I use two antivirus software in a computer? Well, yes and no. Um, they, they cannot be active at the same time. So, for example, if you install a third-party software in Windows, Windows becomes in what's called as um, uh, it, 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 it's, it's still working, but it's in passive mode. 
So only one of the two can be in active mode, right? Um, so that's basically what it means. Um, do, do people do this? Yes. Is it necessary? Maybe not. Uh, especially the Windows antivirus software, it's it's really good and it has been um, improved tremendously in, in the last years. So uh, in most cases, you don't need to buy an extra or a third party antivirus software if you have Windows 10 or Windows 11. Now, there are legitimate software uh, that will interfere with your virus in that in, in with the virus program. In that case, you can create exclusions. You can create files and folder exclusions so that you say, hey, I don't want this software. I know what it is. I trust it. And, and some vendors will give you instructions on how to do that. So that those are the kind of things that we do um, to make sure that our antivirus software and our system works properly. Another uh, important feature of the Windows is the Windows Defender Firewall. Uh, yes, it could be activated or deactivated. It is important that it is not deactivated, right? That the firewall, it's, it's, it's on. Um, we can uh, block or allow, create a block or allow policy. So let's say that we want to block, there's a malicious software going on and and the recommendation is to block that. Well, we, we can do that. Uh, by default, a lot of the use, uh, usual program that you run in Windows are allowed through the firewall, but there may be a case in which you have to do that. Uh, I'll work later on a demo to show you how to do that. Um, so you can create basically rules that would trigger based on the, the port security application or based on an IP address. So I can either block or allow a, a specific IP address, right? Um, this screenshot over here is what is called the uh, Windows Defender Firewall with advanced security, which um, the executable is uh, wf.msc. So if you want to run that from a command prompt or from the run command, this is how you would get to this. Or even, and then to search for it, then again, you go to the search box in Windows and just type Windows Defender Firewall and <clears throat> the advanced security uh, will come up and you just click on it. The encrypting file system is a feature of Windows uh, actually, uh, this is not what I want. All right, so the encrypted file system um, is a feature of Windows that allows you to encrypt a file or a folder. So just basically you right click on a file or a folder and look at the, the Windows over here. You go to encrypt the um, contents of the file and then you can do that. Now that encryption is based on your, on your password, username and password. So, and what it does is that it protects the data when uh, a storage media is lost or stolen. So if you have a hard drive that is stolen, they could steal your laptop. If it is protected with encryption, then uh, people won't be able to have access to that data. Uh, so data uh, cannot be read with the uh, encryption key, basically. Um, so really important stuff with it. Now you have gotta be careful because if you uh, if you lose that account, if you forget your password, then you won't have access to that data. Now you can create what is called um, uh, restore agent or decryption agent. You can add other people that in case that in a company, for example, if an employee leaves and uh, and basically uh, they will lose access to those files. So you gotta be careful with that kind of stuff. So, encrypting file system, again, EFS is a feature of Windows that it encrypts the selected files and folders, and the encryption key is stored in an account, and, and it's linked to the password. So, you got to be careful um, with that stuff over there. But again, for the uh, uh, A-plus exam, you just need to be aware the, about the EFS, the encrypted file system, and what it is and, and, and what it does. Now, if you want to encrypt the entire drive uh, and you have the right editions of Windows, this is not available, for example, in Windows uh, Home uh, Edition, but if you have the right version of Windows, then you can use uh, Windows BitLocker to encrypt a fixed drive on a computer. If you want to encrypt a USB drive, a removable drive, then you use uh, BitLocker to go. 
So two important terms over here to understand uh, for the A plus exam. And, and again, so very simple, you just click on, uh, uh, turn on BitLacker and uh, it will ask you for a number of things, including a password, and, and then you go ahead and do that. Um, now, again, BitLacker for fixed disks and then uh, BitLacker to go for uh, removable drives. Um, if your computer have a, um, uh, a TPM or the trusted uh, platform module, right? So you need that, or you can save it on a uh, USB drive or you can print it out, you can save it. It's important that you save that securely because anyone who has access to that key then would be able to restore, right? It's, it's the recovery key, would be able to restore that. Same thing that I said about the EFS, encryption, it's a great thing to protect the confidentiality of data, uh, but you should be careful. You gotta make sure that you have access to that data because you can lose yourself the access to the data if it is encrypted, okay? All right, so this is the end of uh, the first part in this lesson 17. Uh, work uh, station security. Here we uh, discuss password and end user best uh, practices. Right? Um, so we also talked about uh, account management and account policies, you know, having a long password, uh, configuring the uh, lockout and a screen lockout, right? We also talked about the execution control. Uh, in Windows that you can turn on and off. We also talked about downloading software from uh, secure sources. We talked about Windows uh, Defenders antivirus and how it is important that it's up to date and that uh, we check to make sure everything is healthy. Um, we talked about the Windows Defender firewall, how it can be activated, deactivated. We can create rules to either block ports, uh, um, an IP address, etc. We talked about the encrypting file system or EFS that is used to encrypt uh, uh, files and, and folders. And we also discussed uh, the Windows uh, BitLocker and BitLocker to go to encrypt an entire hard drive, whether it is a fixed drive or a hard drive, a removable hard drive. For this uh, uh, objective, you are going to now complete the lab uh, configure workstation security, right? Where you will learn how to enforce security settings using the local security policy in the Windows operating system.